Okay, so um, we, we have a new understanding of what death and dying mean to us in today's society and we've shown that through a wide range of spectrums and the different discussions and the different inputs really from the panellists here. Um, for example, through the technology, through extended life and people's perception of what a good death or a good m or a meaningful funeral is. And I just want the speakers to kind of put a little bit of input into what they think the role of design might be or whether whether there needs to be some new forms of design that might enter into that conversation. Is that for me? That's for everyone. Can you hear me? I think it's the there yeah, go. it should be. Uh, new forms of design. So whether um, death needs to have new forms of design based on the way that we've been discussing how technology has progressed and the way that um, in today's society, we might need new meanings for what death and dying are. Um, I think a lot of this is, uh, well, since I've been doing this formally inside the hospital um, at St. Mary's, one of the things I've noticed is that when you actually speak to professionals and healthcare professionals, they have like the, you know, they, they design all sorts of things all the time which, which make, you know, death easier, more compassionate, mm. um, safer, you know, all these things. Um, the, the design aspect of it can get wrapped up in sort of aesthetics to the point that it's not about, um, partly it can be a bit of a distraction. And I think there's uh, two things that r the designer can do, which is kind of normalize the experience of death, which can be the aesthetics and, and everything else can be a positive thing. Um, or they can try and help problem solve some of the harder problems. Mm. Um, and I think that's the benefit of design in this space is that we tend to have a, a way of thinking which is, you know, it can cross the, the gulf between disciplines or it can cross the sort of conceptual gulf that some people through training or through attitude or through anything else find difficult. Okay. Um, do you want to pitch into that, Ross? I know you've been doing some work with the Helix Centre, which Ivor is a part of, and also Open IDEO, around ideas of design and engagement. Yeah. Um, I think because we're working in such a resource-constrained world now, and yet the need for more and better care is growing all the time, I think using different perspectives of how we can enhance access to services, how we can communicate differently between services. Um, I think healthcare professionals can be very creative, but I think bringing a new perspective is really vital now, and I think that's the key added resource. Um, and I've seen some great, some great developments just through doing things differently using artists, designers, creators, working with quite simple problems. And I've become increasingly interested in the way different disciplines work together. I was saying earlier that we all work, we all, we all read the same journals. So doctors read doctors' journals and perhaps sociologists read sociologist journals and designers read designers' journals. So we need to share more ideas and that's something that I've really enjoyed doing and needs to be done more. So yes, need more designers in healthcare. <laughs> uh, I, so this is a great question because I think that here we go. Uh, is that uh, I don't actually I, you know as I'm sitting here I don't know I don't know if death needs more design, but and but here hang on, but <laughs> but it will always get design uh, because I think that design is the word we're using right now, but that in the history of death. <clears throat> Again, let's just talk about like England, the UK, and, and the States, the two places I know, I know the best. You know, every sort of period uh, of human interaction with, it, with death responds in its own unique ways to what are seen as the problems. So what do I mean? So one of my favorite periods of, of death invention and design are, are late 19th, early 20th century devices to alert the living if the person has been buried prematurely. And these were devices that would be attached to coffins or mausoleums, like little bells you could ring from mm -hmm. the inside, or horns that would go off, 
Uh, also devices to try and prevent stealing the body. So one of the most brilliant ones was a design that actually was a little mini uh, like gun cannon. It was called a missile in the patent. And if you opened up the coffin the wrong way, it would actually launch a, like a bullet at you, it would like shoot you <laughs> to try and prevent you from stealing, stealing the body. And my point is simply this, is that those were real concerns back then. To us, it seems rather funny, right? And to be sure, something like embalming or also modern crem cremation solved the bearing, being buried premature point. Because if you weren't dead before either of those processes, you were afterwards. Uh, and we've also become quite much better at saying when a person really is dead. Although we still have these occasional cases. No, no, but I mean, we still have these cases where people actually like wake up. Uh, and sometimes we, re we revert to an older language of it's a miracle because no one else knows what to say. Um, so I think that in terms of today, what we have is we have, we have a very interesting language that's developed around trying to respond to what we see as the current issues around death and dying. And that in you know, a future time, which may not be that, that far away, we will as well come up with perhaps a new word, but certainly new ideas around mm -hmm. what it is people are trying to you know, accomplish. Mm -hmm. So, so there always be that, I think, that, that kind of response to it. And in case you're curious, a lot of the earlier stuff is all patented which is why you can go to Google Patents and find these amazing designs. <laughs> uh, we were gonna do a project one time where I was gonna be buried in the ground and we were gonna try each of them to see if they worked. <laughs> um, and it didn't pan out, but I'm still coming at you, welcome, trust, to try and get money for that. Because I think it would be really interesting to try, right, to see if they actually if they work. Don't know what Louise has to say about that, yeah. but. <laughs> uh, well, from from my perspective, which is having just come from a local crematoria near here, um, and I really go for the crematoria, I hate them. <laughs> I think they need to be totally trashed and rebuilt um, from the ground up. There's a real disconnect between some of the stuff that people are constantly sharing on my Facebook walls about mm -hmm. um, urns that turn people into trees and the mushroom suits and what I experience on a daily basis, which is not clients telling me that that's what they want. Mm. What they want to do is go to their local crematoria where their granddad was cremated and mm. know that that space is adequately designed to have that funeral. And from a, you know, doing funerals several times a week, that is not my experience. They are a nightmare mm. and no one is addressing it. I heard only today that a local authority around here, which operates, I think, three crematoria have just made everyone in the crematoria redundant um, and will be replacing them with staff at minimum wage. Now this local authority is known for having very, very low standards anyway. They can't even get the toilets right. The toilet seats don't even close in this particular crematoria I'm referring to. And now it's about to get worse. So we're having all these very highbrow conversations about, mm. you know, amazing design and ash has been turned into vinyls and so on but it's just totally irrelevant to what we experience um, on the day-to-day -day basis where literally the whole thing just needs to be torn down <laughs> and start all over again and it needs to be regarded as important the problem is it's seen as well they're dead it's just a funeral people are just gonna go with whatever they're given and traditionally people have and people need to start taking a stand and saying no this is not acceptable this is important and we need to do it properly so that leads to a really interesting point, actually. Why is there um, a lot of action in design happening in the hospice sector and not enough action of design happening within the actual after-death center? And I think that could be a really interesting conversation point, potentially. Um, I don't know if anyone's got any input for that, but... Well, um, I think the money is in the... I mean, I hate to sound like a real jerk. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I, I hate... I mean, I, can I say it? I mean, cause yeah. Was, I think it's, I think, because you have to understand too, like there's, and, and the, 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 the irony, the, the sad, tragic irony of crematoria, for example, is in the earlier part of the 20th century, they were state of the art. You know what I mean? Like there was a time when these were state of the art facilities. Uh, and you can go all, all over all parts, many different parts of Europe and find these amazing crematoriums, with really, really beautiful facilities. Um, and that notion of state-of-the-artness has really kind of been lost. And I think that's why we've shifted more towards maybe dying or the dying part right now because that's what we're, we find ourselves in. But also we've got a, pop, a bigger and bigger population that's, that is heading into dying more mm. and more. 
um, as we have a you know a mortality spike on its way. Um, so yeah, for me, I think that partly that that just seems where the resource lies. Yeah. So I think in. in it, if anyone else wants to jump in. Well, just I've been quite interested um, since I was at a lecture by one of John's colleagues thinking about why hospices, and I don't know who else is from a hospice here, we sort of abandon the body at the moment of death, mm. and actually hospices should be working with people like Louise to help people mm. plan remembrance, because what hospices do well, I think... Their main mission is to create a memory for those who live on, so getting the ending right, but then it can all be harmed by getting the after-death experience wrong. So I think there's a real opportunity there for hospices and hospitals, perhaps, to look at dead bodies differently and work in a different way and possibly bypass funeral directors. <laughs> so. So I think there are questions that are being brought up around money and cost and, you know, these kind of areas of... So I'm really interested in whether, whether we think money is a guiding principle when designing death and whether more design should focus on things which are... could um, al alleviate some of that cost around death and dying. Because I think there's been some really interesting research from Bath about the cost of funerals and certainly Louise always talks a lot about the cost of funerals. And I wonder whether design is focusing on kind of what you might call fancy products or accessories for death may, may in fact be um, pushing forward the idea of death as a, as a form of product, as a form of consumption, as opposed to something that maybe is more meaningful, as you might have done. I mean, perhaps there's something to say about that. Yeah, absolutely. There's so much talk, especially at the moment it's been discussed um, over the last year in Parliament about funeral poverty and the outrageous cost of funerals and so on. The problem with lots of this information is that in the press, especially, um, the outrageous cost of dying and death and the cost of the price of a funeral is from research by insurance companies who are wishing to scare you into buying a funeral pre-plan. Um, so actually getting the real truth from the press is um, really tricky. And in my experience, the most meaningful and relevant funerals I've done have cost very little because it's not about the big fancy hearses, it's not about spending lots of money on what I call funeral hardware, but really about acknowledging the funeral software, which is the words and the tiny little details that can make such a big difference. And I think where the, the industry um, fails is that we have these big packages where funeral directors want to sell you coffins and extra limos and so on because that's where all the profit is. That's where they make their money. And in that, we've totally lost that if we could just have a service that was a basic framework for someone has died, there's a dead body, we need to do something with that, but we need to regard the living and we need to stop looking at limos and flowers as the most important signs of dealing with grief. And um, keep everything simple and then build something around that I think that would make much more sense and be a much more cost-effective option. Excellent. So I think in, in terms of this sort of the, what we might call the medicalization or the approach to death and dying that is sat, sit, situated in a medical sphere and then passes into something that is not taking into account certain things, I was interested from your provocations around whether we could think about care not only for people's bodies but also for people's social, cultural, and spiritual needs. And I know something. this is something you're quite passionate about, Rose. Um, so do we think this, this is something that could be... Is this a kind of a principle, an aspiration, or something perhaps that needs to be designed in at the base of systems and services? So perhaps that's a bit more to Rose and I, Ivor. Um, I mean, I guess medicine used to be more holistic and mind and body were much more linked up. But as technology has allowed so many possibilities to bits of the body, there are now specialists of the left eyebrow or the fourth finger of your right hand. Um, so, and often the sense of a whole person and what matters to them is completely lost. And I see that in the hospital setting. 
I don't know how we bring it back because the whole concept of generalism, you know, even GPs are specialising now into different areas. Specialists and how it's back to medical training, I guess. But what I know from people, particularly people in the last months or weeks of life, they want to be seen for who they are, for what they've done. They want to be seen to have a past, a present and a future. And I guess a lot of my role now as my career comes to an end is to role model the sort of conversations that need to happen in hospital. So alongside the fragmentation, we need to rebuild and find very quick ways to get to know people and teach those to doctors and nurses and all those who are working with patients. But it's absolutely critical because mm. it's part of healing um, and that's another dirty word in medicine. I think one of the things that... Um, <clears throat> When we've been designing or thinking about designing for this more holistic approach is this trap that we fall into and I'm kind of like, oh, I annoy everyone in the studio for it because basically I kind of go, that's all very well for the white middle class 55 year old, but what about the 27 year old Pakistani person? You know, mm. like who's like the minorities and the sort of people who have like really amazingly rich cultural you know, backbone to the experience of dying, which is kind of like then shoved into the NHS or shoved into sort of the experience of, of terminal illness, which is like, it's really difficult. And it's like the, the mm. problem that ends up happening is that there's a, there's a contraction of time that people can't have enough time to really explore what really means mm -hmm. to that person or that person themselves doesn't have enough time to kind of explore it for themselves. And so it's a really, it's a really tricky thing to do. And so we hold this, you know, um, I kind of agree, John. Like in terms of um, what we're really designing, but like as if we're thinking of designing new services or trying to support clinicians mm -hmm. in, in in healthcare, like we fall into this trap a little bit of of designing for ourselves, and mm -hmm. that's kind of mm -hmm. we have to fight against that. Um, and yeah, that was another point I forgot. Yeah, I, th I think it's it's in in a sense, when you're designing a system or a service, you're in inherently designing something general. Mm. And actually, people have very specific needs. So I had a colleague who was talking to me about a woman who had had a lot of, um, actually, abuse when she was younger. And she didn't want to be touched when she was a patient in a hospice dying. And in, in, a, in a sense, she was seen by the team in this hospice as being a difficult patient. And it was really critical because actually, she was telling people she didn't want to be touched, and there was a very specific reason, a very personal reason behind that. So I think the danger in designing systems is we begin to generalize people's experience, and actually, um, when we follow a system, we don't see that individual person. And I'm really interested in the way that kind of co-design and co-creation, working with patients and working with you know, groups, can try and begin to stop it being about me as a designer and start being about us as a kind of group and how we move forward to that. I don't know if you've, if you've had experience with working in that way in your work. Yeah, so one of the things that we, I often say is that designers have this like tendency to simplify incredibly complex systems as part mm. of like the allure of what design can do. And it's like, the example I always make is like your iPhone. Like it's like mm. the, it's the exercise of incredible complexity and in that like, it doesn't matter that you don't know how it works just because it works. And you're like, that's really good design and you're like, but you don't, like, it's all hidden from you and like we're, we perpetuate this myth that like simple is good mm. and it, it hides the complexity of the systems that we live in and, and the experience of disease and, and health decline and, and death is like mm. such a complex thing for every individual person that I wonder like part of me kind of wishes I had the time to try and figure out a new practice for this because this is like mm. how do we design for care or how do we design for death which incorporates those sorts of practices that require that nuance mm. and require that um, different thinking. It's, it's not really tackled like, you know, open IDEO and IDEO are a good example like of huge brain power of, a, of design studios and expertise trying to tackle it. But they fall into exactly the same traps. Like it doesn't really matter how mm. good or how exp uh, you know, expert you are. Like there's lots of traps you fall into. That, so the mm. old ways of thinking of design are not really adequate for this sphere. I think. Yeah. Do you want? Yeah, jump in, John. 
<clears throat> I think there's, there's one of the other key things to think about, I think any kind of design project around death and dying, and I think it, I, Idea is a really interesting um, point on this in their initial project, trying to get around death and dying. And, and full disclosure, I've spoken with the idea group here in London. Had a really nice lunch there, actually, with them talking about death and design stuff. And I, I think that there's, there's one key thing about death to always keep in mind, which is it is, as everyone talks about, universal, which is true. We're all going to die, right? It's also incredibly radically individualized meaning we all die differently than everybody else, even if we die collectively together. So even if it's a plane of people that die, each one of those people is dying on their own, separate from everybody else. And so you have this odd paradox of both this universal and radical singularity that is at the crux of what's going on because mm. you can design a death system, but if the point is we're responding to what is the dominant form of people dying right now, well, let's say cancer deaths, and this is what my colleague Tony Walter and Erica Borgstrom, who's in the back, mm -hmm. have written about this, mm -hmm. about you know if you're gonna use cancer, for example, as a dominant model, you're excluding a whole bunch of other people who, for example, might have dementia and Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you an even bigger, more interesting case than that, which is, uh, for example, uh, camp survivors from World War II with Alzheimer's who, in advanced Alzheimer's, think they're back in the camp and are convinced that the doctors or the medical staff are Nazi guards mm. trying to get them. So what do you do? Do you just sedate people like that out of a kind of ethical uh, medical practice, or do you not and allow them to continue imagining they're back in the camp? I mean, and these, these are ethical quandaries that are, are, I think, part of the broader human spectrum of what exactly is death and dying. Mm -hmm. And so I think as soon as we humans enter into this whole terrain of we're trying to control death in a way, and by control I'm using that term loosely, we're trying to control death, who, this is when we start to enter into all of these bigger complex, these complexities, mm -hmm. you know. Did you want to jump in or? Well, it was just funny yeah. because my, my mom is German and she um, had a friend who was in a care home, an older, very old German woman, who in her dementia didn't speak any more English, so would only speak German. Oh, yeah. So mm -hmm. my mom would speak German with her but one of the, the carers was like, Can, don't, don't speak loudly. It was like, why not? Because like, there's a woman who was in the French resistance over there. Yeah. If she hears you speaking German, she's going <laughs> to jump out the window. <laughs> and it was this weird thing of like, the more they whispered, the weirder it got, because it looked like they were kind of conspiring. Yeah. But what was amazing was this, this story of like, how does someone who lived in Germany hmm. end up with a French resistance fighter in a care home in Edinburgh? Yeah. And like, that's like incredible. <laughs> that's the human condition right there. Yeah. <laughs>